Today our study is going to be on a, a shorter passage, Revelation 22, just verses 1 through 5, and I thought it would be good for us to read this passage together. So the words are up on the screen if you join me in reading Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as a crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His bondservants will see Him, serve Him. And they will see his face, and his name will be upon their foreheads. And they'll no longer have any need of the light of a lamp, and no longer have the need because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. You all did a much better job of reading than I did. Okay, let me pray. Father, we are weak and we are needy. We come to your throne of grace knowing that you are forever our loving Father, the one who cares for us. We pray now that you would speak to us through your word, that it would encourage us, that it would challenge us, that it would guide us, that we might know you and your son better when we're done today because of our time of study. Thank you so much for our brothers and sisters who've already led us in worship through song. We now pray that we would worship you through our study of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible begins with mankind living in a perfect environment that God has created for them. That environment was the Garden of Eden. And as we're going to see in our study of God's Word this morning, the Bible ends in the same way, with mankind in the Garden of Eden. According to Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 8, The Lord God planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there He put the man He had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the Hebrew language of the Old Testament, the word for Eden means delight. That's how the same Hebrew word gets translated in Psalm chapter 36 verse 8, they feast on the abundance of your house, you give them to drink from the river of your delights. So Eden was a garden of delight for Adam and Eve. And a significant part of that delight was getting to eat from the many trees in the garden, including the tree of life. Sadly, that delightful experience came quickly to an end because Adam and Eve disobeyed God's single prohibition about not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as a result, they were expelled from the garden of delight and thus barred from eating from the tree of life. Genesis chapter 3, verses 23 and 24 state that the Lord God banished Adam from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed him on the east side of the garden of Eden and cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Since then, all human beings have lived east of Eden with no access to the tree of life. But that's going to change one day when, according to Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, God makes all things new. Part of His new creation will be the establishment of an eternal Eden in which the tree of life is again available to the people of God. John makes reference to this in the opening verses of Revelation chapter 22, where he writes that he, the angel who's been showing him things since chapter 21, he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of the street. And on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit, every season. Back in chapter 2, verse 7, Jesus tells the church of Ephesus, to him who overcomes, I give the right to eat from the tree of life 
which is in the paradise, and paradise is a word that means garden or park. It's in the paradise of God. So the promise is made. You're going to get to go to this paradise of God and eat from the tree of life. That's Revelation chapter 2. Now in Revelation chapter 22, we see the fulfillment of that. As John describes what life in this paradise of God with the tree of life in it will be like. And based on the first five verses of Revelation chapter 22... We're going to consider this morning three blessings that God's people will get to enjoy in this restored Garden of Eden. Revelation chapter 22, eternity's picture as this restored Eden, and in this Garden of Delight, God's people will experience fullness of life from Him. That's the first blessing, fullness of life from God. Verses 1 and 2, the angel showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Like the restored Eden that John sees, the original Garden of Eden not only had a tree of life, but there was also a river in it. According to Genesis chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, in the middle of the garden was the, were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and a river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and from there was separated into four headwaters. In the restored Eden, the river is said to flow from the throne of God and of the Lamb, which means that this water of life is coming from God Himself. God is the one who is the source of fullness of life for His people. The river that is coming from the throne of God is flowing through the middle of the street of Eden, so it tells us that Eden, this Eden is a city park. It's got a street in it. It's a city garden. And on either side of this river is the tree of life. This has bewildered Bible scholars a little bit. What is John describing here? Is there one massive tree that somehow has roots on both sides of the river? Or, as seems more likely, is John using the word tree as a collective noun? So he's referring to many trees that line both sides of the river, each one of these trees being like the single tree of life that was in the first Garden of Eden. doesn't really matter. In either case, the important point is that God's people will again be able to eat from the tree of life and also they'll be able to drink from the river of the water of life. Concerning the water of life, John says in Revelation chapter 21, or God says, John's writing, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. And the invitation is given in chapter 22, verse 17. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take of the water of life without cost. So this water of life is quenching the thirst of those whose souls are dry and needy. In Psalm 63, verse 1, David exclaims, O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Try as we might, there is nothing in this creation that can quench the thirst of our souls. doesn't matter how much pleasure we have, no amount of comfort or possessions or success or family or friends will satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts. Only the Creator can do that. And this is why Jesus says in John chapter 7, verse 37, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. This is what the song we sang earlier was all about, coming to these waters even now and drinking from what Christ offers us. In terms of quenching the thirst of our soul, this world is a dry and weary land. But if we will go to Jesus, we'll humbly receive Him as our Savior and Lord, then we can taste these living waters that He offers. But 
our souls will never be fully and permanently satisfied here because we leak. We're like a bucket with holes in it. One day, has this ever happened to you? One day, your heart is just thrilled with God. You're, you're content, you're happy, you're overflowing with joy, and then you wake up and the next morning, it's like, what in the world happened? You're discouraged, you're bummed, you're crying out to the Lord, oh God, you are my God, my soul is again thirsty for you. And it, on and on it goes. We, we feel satisfied one day and thirsty the next. That's not going to happen in the restored Garden of Eden because then our thirsty souls will forever be satisfied by this water of life that comes gushing forth from the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. And in the restored Eden, not only will our aching souls finally be satisfied, all the desires satisfied, but the needs of our bodies will be fully met as well. Because in verse 2, on either side of the river is the tree of life. Bring 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. Whether it's one tree or many trees, this tree of life is going to be unlike any we see now because it's not going to go through a dormant winter season. It's not going to produce one or perhaps two crops a year. But every month, there's going to be another harvest, which means it's a year-round supply of food. And along with constant nourishment for God's people through the fruit, this tree of life also has other benefits because John says that its leaves are for the healing of the nations. And we might think, well, why do we need healing? Chapter 21 verse 4 talks about there being no mourning or pain or crying or death. So we're not going to have any need for healing power. These these leaves aren't going to be used for treating any illness. I think what John is saying here is they're going to promote overall health and vitality. Everyone in the new Garden of Eden is going to feel good all the time. Third John, verse 2, John writes to Gaius saying, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. So we see here that John is concerned for his friend physically and spiritually. He's praying that in body and soul, Gaius would thrive. And it's possible in some limited ways for that to happen now. But we're going to experience it in fullness in eternity because we're going to be drinking from the river of the water of life. and That's going to quench the thirst of our soul. Every desire of our heart will be met, and we're going to be eating from the tree of life so our bodies will forever prosper and be in good health. In the garden city, we're going to experience then a fullness of spiritual life, a fullness of physical life, and both of these coming to us from God. Also, in eternity, we will render worshipful, curse-free service to God. In the New Eden, God's people will render worshipful, curse-free service to Him. Have you ever heard heaven portrayed or maybe even thought of this state of endless leisure? Oh, I'm going to be fishing and playing golf and reading books or quilting or whatever your favorite activity is. I get to do it all day, every day for eternity. That's the way heaven is sometimes portrayed. Another way is it's like a never-ending worship service. Are we just going to be singing songs of praise forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No, we're not. John describes something different than endless leisure or endless worship service. He says, in the restored Garden of Eden, we will serve God as we reign with Him over His creation. Verse 3, there will no longer be a curse the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and His bondservants will serve Him, verse 5, and they will reign forever and ever. In the original Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had a job to do. Their task was to care for the garden. 
According to chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. And part of his cultivating work, his, his working the ground, was to expand its influence. The, the Garden of Eden was to be expanded throughout the earth because according to chapter 1, verse 28, God's blessing to Adam and Eve was be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every living thing that moves on the earth. In his book, Every Good Endeavor, which is about the Bible's view of work, Pastor Tim Keller states that the word subdue in Genesis 1, 28, indicates that even in its original unfallen form, God made the world to need work. His world was not a hostile place, so it needed to be beaten down like an enemy. Rather, its potential was undeveloped, so it needed to be cultivated like a garden. The fall of mankind when Adam and Eve sin against God, they rebel against Him and introduce sin into the human experience, that doesn't happen until Genesis chapter 3, which means that work was not a consequence of the fall. It was not a punishment for sin. Rather, work is part of God's original good plan for mankind. Had God wanted to, He could have made a maintenance-free garden, or He could have assigned the task to the angels so that Adam and Eve could have kicked back and relaxed all the time. But instead, he wanted his image bearers to not only enjoy this garden of delight, but also to work it, to cultivate it, to take care of it and develop it. And the same thing is going to be true in the renewed Garden of Eden as his servants serve him and reign with him over his new creation. In the Greek language of the New Testament, the verb that is translated serve, his bondservants will serve him, carries with it overtones of worship. And so, as one commentator explains, the idea is of service through worship, or we could say it's of worship through service. The noun form of this work plus worship word is used by Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where he writes, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And that little phrase, service of worship, is translating one Greek word, the same one that John is using in Revelation chapter 22. For Paul, worshipful service to God isn't something restricted to Sunday mornings. It's not just for a couple hours now. Instead, it's the defining mark of our lives because we're presenting our entire lives to God as a living and holy sacrifice. And this means that every aspect of our lives, 24 hours a day, including our work, whether we're paid or not paid for our work, whether it's at home or in the marketplace, it should all be thought of as an act of worship to God. So we're not just worshiping on Sunday mornings, we're worshiping every day of the week. We're supposed to be worshiping while we're working. That's the attitude that we're supposed to carry with us to work. Do you do that all the time? Huh. I don't do that all the time, and I'm paid to. So we fall short of that ideal. But we won't in heaven. As His bond servants, we will serve God. That is, we will render worshipful service to Him as we work in the renewed Garden of Eden. I don't know what all our jobs might be. I've already told the Lord I'd kind of like to be a dishwasher. I think we're going to do lots of parting if I understand things properly. There's going to be lots of feasting, so I figure it's going to be kind of messy. I'd be glad to clean up the dishes. Some of the, you can cook. Uh, others are farm, I'll clean the dishes. Whatever our jobs are going to be in the new heavens and the new earth, we can uh, fight about that later. We can argue. Maybe we get to switch jobs. I don't know. But whatever jobs we have, they're going to bring us great joy because they will no longer be under the curse, a curse that was pronounced all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve disobey God. They eat from the forbidden fruit. 
They're removed from the garden, and God says to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, and that word toil there could actually be translated pain. When, when God speaks to Eve, He says, in pain you're going to bear children. Well, this is the same word in Hebrew. In toil or pain, you will eat of it, eat of the ground all the days of your life. And why? Why is there going to be this painful toil associated with working the ground? Because, verse 18, both thorns and thistles, it will grow for you. And this explains why whatever job we have, no matter how good it is, is always to some degree involving painful toil. All of our work is invested, is infested, not invested, infested with various thorns and thistles. Apparent futility. I'm doing this job. I'm doing the best of my ability. Nothing's happening. Why isn't, why aren't I seeing any results? Or how about monotony? How many years have I done this? Or emotional stress? Or physical exhaustion? Or an unreasonable boss? or broken equipment, or difficult circumstances that hinder us from accomplishing our goals. These are all examples of the kinds of thorns and thistles that we encounter in our work. But again, it's not going to be like that in the new Eden, because then, according to verse 3, there will no longer be any curse. So our worshipful Service to God, the work we do in reigning with Him over His creation will be curse-free. And as we're in this garden, the best part, the most wonderful blessing is that we will see the face of God. In the new Eden, we will see the face of God. Verse 4 they will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. What a glorious, hope-filled promise. We who are serving God, we who are reigning with God, will get to see God. John states in 1 John chapter 4, verse 12, no one has ever seen God. Peter says something similar in 1 Peter chapter 1, though you have not seen Him, you love Him even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him. This is one of the greatest struggles of the Christian life. We are called to live by faith in a God who is completely invisible to us. Have you ever thought, it would be so much easier if Jesus would just show up on Sunday mornings physically. It would be so much easier. Through creation, through His Word, God reveals Himself to us, and He gives what I think are very compelling reasons for us to believe in Him. But still, we can't see Him. But in heaven, we will. And notice John John doesn't simply say that we will see God. He says, we will see His face. In his book, God is the Gospel, Pastor John Piper points out, if you want to know a person, you don't look mainly at his neck or his shoulders, or his knees. You look at his face. The face is the window to the soul. The face is the revelation of the heart. The face carries the emotions of joy or sadness or anger or grief. The face represents the person in direct communication. Paul states in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, now we see in a mirror dimly But then, face-to-face. Modern mirrors that we have in our homes, made by a chemical process in which glass is coated with a really thin layer of reflective metal, and usually these mirrors provide very bright, clear images of what they reflect. Some mornings, as we drag ourselves into the bathroom and look into the mirror, we might wish they didn't do their jobs quite so well. And ancient mirrors didn't. Because ancient mirrors were made of flat disks of polished bronze. And so, as you looked into an ancient mirror, the image you saw was dark and cloudy. And Paul is using 
the poor reflective quality of ancient mirrors to describe what our communion with God is like now. It's as if we're looking at nothing more than a dark, cloudy image of Him. Yes, we see Him, but only in part, only a little. But a time is coming when we will see God face to face. And I promise you, when you see God face to face, if you know Him, if you're His child, your heart will be flooded with joy like you've never known. And if it turns out I'm wrong, come and see me, I'll give you your money back. But I know I'm not. David declares in Psalm 17, when I awake in the resurrection, I will be fully satisfied. And why will he be fully satisfied? For I will see you face to face. Like fish that are designed to live in water, human beings are designed to live in the physical presence of God. That's where we flourish. That's where we're our happiest. That's where we're our most content. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 says that Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They got to stroll through the garden of Eden with the Lord. They were living in God's presence. And when Eden is restored, all of God's people will live in his presence and see his face. And we will be thrilled with an all-satisfying delight that is far greater than the greatest happiness that this world has to offer. And it gets even better than that because looking into the face of our creator will not only bring us joy, but it will also result in our glorious transformation. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So Paul is again using this metaphor we've just talked about of looking into a mirror, seeing a dark, cloudy image, and Paul is reminding us that in this life, our perception of God is limited. Nevertheless, he's also saying that it's by beholding God as best we can with the eyes of faith that we become like Him. The more clearly we see God as He's revealed in His Word, the more we are transformed into His image. This is an essential principle of the Christian life. If we want to grow in godly character, it's not a matter of just moral transformation, of somehow willing ourselves to be better people. We mature from one degree of glory to another only insofar as we behold the glory of God. That's what we're trying to do as we gather together every Sunday in our worship, in our study of God's Word. Can we leave here with just a little better glimpse of who God is? is we become like what we behold. And so part of the Christian life is trying as best we can to behold God as he's revealed in his word. And when we're finally able to see God face to face, this process that has been so long and grueling in this life will instantly be brought to completion. John says in 1 John chapter 3 verse 2, we know that when he appears, when Christ appears, the Son of God, we will be like him. And why is that? Because we will see him just as he is. Our beholding of Christ will result in us instantly becoming like Christ. Which means that when we see the face of God, we're going to be done with sin forever. We're never again going to say anything or do anything that dishonors God or hurts another person. And we're never again going to have an evil thought or a bad attitude. We're never again going to fail to show love. Morally, we will be conformed to the image of God's Son because we'll see Him face to face. In his book entitled Holiness, 
19th century pastor J.C. Ryle warns, how little fit for heaven are many who talk of going to heaven when they die while they have no saving faith, no real acquaintance with Christ. You give Christ no honor here. You have no communion with Him now. You do not love Him. Alas, what would you do in heaven? It would be no place for you. Its joys would be no joys for you. Its happiness would be a happiness into which you could not enter. Its employments would be a wearisome burden to your heart. Oh, repent and change before it's too late. The happiness of heaven, the joys of living in the renewed garden of Eden are all, are all God-centered. They all revolve around the triune God, experiencing fullness of life from God, rendering worshipful service to God, and gazing into the face of God. Don't you long to partake of those blessings? Isn't there something in you that says, yes, that's what I want. That's what I want. I pray for it every day that it might come quickly. And here's the great news. That can be the experience of every person in this room. We can all have that because these blessings are offered freely to everyone. But they'll be enjoyed only by those who have begun a saving relationship with God through His Son in this life. Have you? Not if you've gone to church, not if you read your Bible, not if you served in various ways, but do you know Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord? If not, then you can start right now. Call on Jesus Christ, the one who, who died on the cross, so that all your sins might be wiped away in God's sight and you might be welcomed into the presence of God. Turn from your sins. Receive Christ as Savior and Lord, and you will begin a relationship with God that lasts forever. And when God makes all things new, you'll be welcomed into His restored Garden of Eden, a garden of indescribable delight. Let's pray.